It's been more than 24 hours since a plane with five people on board went down in Denali National Park. Good evening, everyone. Search and rescue teams are staged in Talkeetna. We're told the plane is believed to have crashed at about 11,000 feet in an area known as Thunder Mountain. Channel 2's Derek Minemeyer has the latest details from Talkeetna. Search parties have been battling bad weather like what you see behind me and have decided to suspend the search overnight for five people involved in a plane crash in Denali National Park. The Pavehawk helicopters involved in the search left with hopes of locating the downed plane and returned hours later with nothing to report. The National Park Service says the flight took off just after five Saturday evening with reportedly cloudy skies but calm weather, and it was one of many private tours flying in the area around that time. We spoke with one of those pilots flying near Thunder Mountain who says he knows the pilot from the downed plane. Yeah, I do know. I do know him. Yep. Yeah, he's about my age in his 50s and real nice guy, um, you know, competent pilot. This is a, a really bad situation we've got here. Number one, they're at a very high altitude on the mountain. Uh, being over 10,000 feet in that area is just very steep rock, glacier, ice. Um, it's hard for me to even conceive that the airplane is stable. And David Lee is a pilot for Sheldon Air Service, and he says there's no way to know for sure how the crash happened. Unfortunately, things happen, and, uh, you know, we don't know the particulars of what may have happened. You know, it could have been a mechanical with the airplane. It could have been the weather, a downdraft. The last attempted satellite call made by the pilot came in around 8.30 Saturday night, according to the National Park Service. Lee, who has flown many times in the area around Thunder Mountain, says the temperature at nearly 11,000 feet where the DHC-2 Beaver airplane crashed could have hit below zero overnight. It's pretty bad. It could possibly be the worst disaster on Denali in the history of Denali as far as an airplane accident. Information officer with Denali National Park and Preserve, Catherine Belcher, says the pilot made two successful calls to K2 Aviation, the company to which the plane belongs. But as far as reaching them today, the weather is getting in the way of rescue efforts. There is zero visibility, very low cloud cover, which is really hampering rescue operations. And we've been unable to make visual confirmation of where exactly the crash site is or have any further radio communication or satellite phone communication. We believe that the radio was damaged in the crash. Victoria, the National Park Service confirmed today that the Pavehawk helicopters involved in the search party were unable to make visual confirmation on the downed aircraft. So the search as of now has been suspended. It will continue in the morning, weather dependent. So people should stay tuned to the morning edition for any updates we receive throughout the night. Derek Minemeyer, Channel 2 News. K2 Aviation has canceled flight tours until further notice. The National Park Service has not released information about who the passengers and pilot are on board the crash plane at this time. Good evening, everyone. It's the worst commercial aviation crash in the history of Denali National Park. That's according to the NTSB. Yeah, that's in terms of number of lives lost. And officials say four people are dead. A fifth person is presumed dead after a sightseeing plane went down high in the Alaska Range Saturday evening. The K2 Aviation pilot was Craig Layson, an experienced aviator based out of St. Lean, Michigan. He had flown into Alkeena for the past two summers. His four passengers were from Poland. The National Park Service has not yet released their names. Now we want you to take a look at this picture. It's our very first look at the crash site. Denali National Park and Preserve posted this photo to its Facebook page this afternoon. Now this image clearly shows the danger the pilot and his passengers were facing when that plane hit the mountainside and the danger involved in those rescue operations. In the wider view, you can see the rugged terrain and just how steep that mountain is. And as we zoom in, you can see the wreckage partially buried in the snow and on a very steep snowbank on the side of the mountain. It is hard to see, but it's right there in the middle of your screen. The plane barely visible in the snow. Hard to believe that it stayed in place after that crash, judging by the steepness of the mountainside, nearly 11,000 feet up. A disturbing view of where five people lost their lives. Rescuers were finally able to get to that wreckage this morning near the 11,000 foot summit of a knife edge ridge known as Thunder Mountain. The DHC-2 Beaver set off from Talkeetna just after 5 p.m. Saturday evening, crashing into a crevasse under an overhanging ridge 3,000 feet high above the Cahiltna Glacier. Now, repeated rescue efforts were made Saturday and Sunday, but bad weather hampered those efforts. 
We have several crews in Tel Keitna at this hour to cover this tragic story, including Channel 2's Jack Carney and Sean McGuire. We're going to start with Sean first, who has the very latest on the plans to try to recover the plane and the victims. Sean. Hi, Mike and Maria. The small town of Talkeetna is reeling after a disaster that is unprecedented for K2 aviation. Now, uh, there was a multi-agency push to try and rescue the people on board the plane, but tonight officials are saying that uh, it was uh, not going to happen because there are no survivors. Now, uh, Around 7 a.m. this morning, a small break in weather allowed a National Park Service mountaineering ranger to drop down from a helicopter and finally get to the plane. Officials say the ranger dug through snow inside the wreckage, finding bodies, finding four bodies and no evidence of footprints in the snow coming out, meaning the fifth missing person is presumed dead. The weather conditions had made previous rescue attempts all but impossible. This happened at approximately 6 p.m. on Saturday and we weren't able to actually make visual uh, contact of the site until shortly after 7 a.m. today. Now, a, time pre a temporary flight restriction had been put in place for the area, but it was taken away later, earlier this afternoon. Now, we're told by officials that it's unlikely that any planes, any flight sending planes, are going get to get back into the area, uh, going to get back into the air. Now, as you can hear, there's a helicopter on site. We don't know yet if that has anything to do with the rescue operations. Uh, that are ongoing at the moment. Now, later on in the news hour, we are going to hear from a mountaineering ranger who attempted that rescue earlier today. Mike and Maria. All right, Sean McGuire up in Talkeetna tonight. It is a cold reality for those in the flight sing industry. While thousands of people take to the sky every year to see Alaska from the air and nearly all return safely, uh, most are very aware that they fly with a risk, especially in the unpredictable and unforgiving Alaska range. Jack Carney is live in Telkina, has been speaking to flight scene pilots and others in the community who know the danger is always present, especially in and around the Denali and Thunder Mountain areas where Saturday's plane crash occurred. Jack. Well, David Lee of Sheldon Air says that while Craig Layson might have worked for a competing service, together they were colleagues. And when one deadly incident affects one, it impacts all. Lee says all, they all know the risks of flying north, flying near North America's tallest peak is rapidly changing weather and rugged terrain can pose big dangers. Lee said the whole pilot community is hurting and recovering from the loss of a fellow flyer. You know, you don't wish this on anybody, even though, you know, sometimes it's competitive around here. Um, it does affect, like you say, the whole industry, really in the whole state of Alaska. There's a lot of emotion here about what happened. A little later, we're going to be hearing from Trisha Costello, who runs the Talkeetna Roadhouse, a popular destination for the thousands of tourists that come here each year. Costello not only knew Craig Layson, she also worked with his wife last summer. We're going to hear from her a little bit later in our news hour. Reporting in Talkeetna, Jack Carney, Channel 2 News. So how safe is flight seeing? To put it all in perspective, there are thousands of flight seeing tours each summer in Alaska. The National Transportation Safety Board says 10 people have been killed in sightseeing flights this decade. Channel 2 News reporter Rich Maurer looked into this today. Rich. Mike Maria, those fatalities occurred in flights in southeast Alaska, not here, Denali, or Talkeetna. In one of those cases, the NTSB said the pilot felt pressure to fly even in, even on safe conditions because of the cruise ship schedule. But in Denali, the difficult conditions haven't led to major crashes. How can someone find out about the safety records of aviation companies that take passengers on sightseeing flights? Well, it's not easy. We get calls from time to time calling our main number wanting to know who's a safe operator. That's not our business, quite frankly. Um, I, I, the, that, is a, that is a tough call. There are agencies or services that will actually do that uh, research for you, private individuals. How the average person gets a hold of them, I honestly don't know. K2 says in a prepared statement that it runs a very safe operation and that it only hires experienced pilots and suggested that customers know about its reputation by word of mouth or comments on social media. Good evening, everyone. In the news stories we cover here at Channel 2, sometimes there is just one image, a single picture 
that says it all. And we want you to see one of those right now. It's the first look we got today of the site of the plane crash in Denali National Park. It was posted on the park's Facebook page earlier today. In this wider view, you can see the rugged terrain and just how steep this mountain is. It's hard to see, but if you look right here, that little red spot, this is the wreckage of that flight seeking plane that went down on Saturday evening. Now, the plane is barely visible in the snow, which no doubt made it harder for rescue crews to find it. And it's hard to believe the plane stayed on this very steep snowbank on the side of the mountain. Now, four people are now confirmed dead. The fifth is missing and presumed dead. And we're learning more about the lives lost in that crash, the pilot and four passengers who were visiting from Poland. New tonight, Channel 2's Beth Verge talked to the man who's helping to break the sad news to the families of those Polish visitors. Beth? That's right, Mike. Five families in multiple communities, both stateside and overseas, left to grieve tonight after their loved ones perish in a tragic plane crash here in Alaska. A cold reality in Alaska. Some very difficult flying up there. The beauty and attraction of flight seeing tours here with hopes of spotting Denali from above. A danger. In this case, the helicopters you see here are shifting from search and rescue to recovery. As five people won't see home again after a fatal crash on the mountain this past weekend. I virtually could not believe it. You know, it's a very, very, very sad situation. Four were Polish nationals, traveling as part of a larger group of nine, according to the Polish consulate in Anchorage, responsible for relaying all of this info to the larger consulates and breaking news to kin. The passengers were on a tundra tour, he says, beginning in Alberta and touring through Alaska. Three of the tourists who perished were in their 50s or 60s. It's, it's hard to accept that. You know, they cry, you know, and, and you almost want to cry with them, you know. There's... Then there's veteran pilot Craig Lason, who was flying a K-2 plane on Saturday evening, sending out two distress calls in a desperate attempt at rescue from this. Brutal, snowy conditions, as seen in one of the first pictures taken of the crash site. Very steep rock, glacier, ice. A father and husband. He's about my age in his 50s and real nice guy, um, you know, competent pilot. A friend, too, to fellow flyers. A really nice guy, he'd come over and get coffee and, you know, he'd actually make biscuits and gravy for... Uh, whoever want all the pilots that wanted to come over. Despite the unpredictable and unforgiving Alaska range, the risks of flying near North America's tallest peak usually seem well worth the reward, but not today. And the Polish, największe wyrazy współczucia, condolencje. We are all thinking about the pilot, passengers, their communities, again, both here in the States and overseas. And as most know, there is a delay for this information coming out because next of kin need to be notified first, something that's taken a bit longer with the nature of this case. The National Park Service does say there will be no further updates tonight on the identities of the victims as they are still working to notify those families. Mike, back to you. All right, thank you, Beth. As we showed you, the wreckage of that plane sits in a deep snow-filled crevasse on an almost vertical ridge at nearly 11,000 feet high. It's a location that makes rescues and recovery nearly impossible. Channel 2 Sean McGuire is in Talkeetna with word about how the Park Service will try to make the impossible happen. There are five bodies likely lying trapped inside a plane high in the Alaska range. Officials at the National Park Service are formulating a plan to stage a recovery to bring those bodies down off the mountain. Weather, though, will determine when that can happen. Yesterday, we had uh, military aircraft go up. We had NPS helicopters go up. The wind was gusting to 25 to 35 knots. I'm sorry, it was regularly 25 to 35 knots, gusting up to 60. Crews with the Park Service will then head back up the mountain using helicopters to drop down on short ropes to attempt the recovery. Basically, I'm wearing a climbing harness, clip into it and hang just like you would if you were hanging from a rope. But it's not the ranger who is in control. In this particular case and in all short hauls, we really don't have to do much. The pilot has all the hard work. He positions us kind of like that game at the mall where you're trying to grab something. Uh, he positions us exactly where we need to go, and then we just head there. Pilots can only safely spend five minutes at the crash site due to the risk of crashing themselves. A veteran talkeetna based pilot said sometimes rescuers leave a plane and bodies in place because it can shed light on what happened leading up to the crash. The Park Service says that has happened in the past with a military plane in Denali, but recovery is the priority. Absolutely, absolutely. As for the plane itself, officials did not have an answer for how or when they might try and get it off the mountain. Reporting from Talkeetna, Sean McGuire, Channel 2 News. 
We're following developments in the story on KTUU.com. You can check in 24 7 for updates. In a state with vast stretches of wilderness, mountains, and unpredictable weather, it's no secret that aviation in Alaska can be dangerous for the unprepared. After last weekend's deadly plane crash in Denali National Park, we wanted to find out about the survival gear that pilots have to carry. Channel 2's Cameron McIntosh spoke with an expert today about what emergency supplies pilots keep on board when they're flying over the last frontier. When it comes to plane crashes, survival equipment on board can mean the difference between life and death. Today we spoke to the folks here at Eagle Enterprises to find out what exactly pilots are required to carry by state statute and what gear they recommend. But like the old adage of bush pilots that have been flying around here since the 40s, they'll say, if it's not on you, it's camping gear. If it's on you, it's survival gear. Since 1972, Shane Langland and his business Eagle Enterprises have been supplying Alaska pilots with emergency rations and equipment they'll hopefully never have to use. You know, in the Mesa kit, you've got to have a fish kit. It's kind of defined what they need. You need a headlet per person. This is a small signaling flare, matches. Coast, these are actually Coast Guard approved rations. They kind of take, like, taste like Crisco. And that's just the minimum required by state law. Many pilots will opt to carry more. And Langland says Alaska pilots are very good about keeping their gear straight. And we see the commercial pilots, the private pilots, the student pilots. They're very proactive. It, we, we've got a great culture of safety in our commercial carriers and our private aviation folks. And we're very fortunate for that in Alaska. In addition to the basic kit, Langland recommends carrying multiple ways to start a fire and signal rescuers. But there's one piece of equipment you should never fly without. And in today's world, probably the most critical bit of equipment is your personal locator beacon. Because right. that takes the search out of search and rescue. All planes are required by the FAA to have a built-in emergency beacon. But a PLB like this one is small enough to fit in your pocket. And you can carry it with all your other survival gear in a vest. But Langland says having the right survival gear isn't just about checking off a list. But everything I'm going to put on my person is something I'll be very comfortable with using. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to... How does this work again? What am I supposed to do? Whatever I use, it matters to me. It's about finding what works best for you and what's going to keep you alive in an aviation emergency. Cameron McIntosh, Channel 2 News. New pictures tonight that show the extent of the danger on the mountain. Now, this is what the de Havilland Beaver looked like before the accident last weekend. And this is what the plane looks like now perched on Thunder Mountain in Denali National Park. A major decision was made this afternoon regarding the recovery of the wreckage. Good evening, everyone. It's another devastating blow to the loved ones of the five people killed in that plane crash in Denali National Park earlier this week. After finally being able to visit the crash site today, rangers have concluded that recovering the bodies will be too dangerous. Channel 2's Cameron McIntosh is live in Talkeetha tonight with the latest. Cameron. Well, Mike and Alexis, after days of bad weather, thwarted attempts to launch a recovery mission, rangers were finally able to make it to the crash site today. A single ranger suspended from a helicopter was able to examine the plane up close for the first time since Sunday. And uh, dramatic new photos, as you've just seen, released this evening, show the aircraft perched at the end, at the edge of a very steep slope. The plane is uh, sitting on an unstable crevasse in an area that's seen about two and a half feet of fresh snow since the crash. So rangers say there is a considerable avalanche danger in the area, and the plane is broken in half to complicate matters further, with the tail section dragging the wreckage down towards a 3,500-foot drop. There's also reportedly a lot of jagged metal protruding from the wreckage, which is a danger to rangers as well. So after evalu evaluating all of those conditions at the, at the crash site today, rangers decided that it would be too dangerous to try and remove the bodies or even any of the wreckage from the crash site. And so they've decided that a recovery mission will not be attempted. Live in Talkeetna, I'm Cameron McIntosh, Channel 2 News. All right, this all leads us to another big question. What about the investigation into this deadly crash? Channel 2 reporter Beth Furr joins us now. And Beth, you spoke this afternoon with the leaders of the National Transportation Safety Board here in Alaska. What's next? So amongst all the questions still swirling, there's the big one of how this investigation is going to go from here on out, knowing that this downed aircraft is stuck on a mountainside for the time being. 
One might think that without the plane or the passengers or pilot inside, the investigation would be halted or at least severely hindered. But experts say that is not the case here. New photos from the National Park Service are providing insight into how this tragic crash happened, but a library of them is exactly what the National Transportation Safety Board, which conducts independent investigations of all civil aviation crashes in the U.S., says it is banking on. Hundreds of NPS photos, a meteorologist, rescue crew statements, all part of working out the exact timeline of this crash. We are very much in the preliminary stages. We're not drawing any conclusions. We're definitely not going to speculate. Um, what I would ask is just give us time to be able to do our investigation. Work on the preliminary report, which has not yet been released, is underway. And despite the lack of a wreckage exam or hands-on analysis, Johnson says he expects that report to be released next week. 250 hours, that's the amount of flight time required for a pilot to obtain a commercial license. Channel 2's Jack Carney spoke with several companies today, commercial pilots and non-commercial bush pilots, about the federal rules and requirements. Jack joins us now in studio with that aspect of the story. Jack. Alexis and Mike, all commercial companies I spoke with today refrained from going on camera because they did not want to speculate about the cause of the accident, the company involved, or the pilot who tragically lost his life. A public relations firm representing K2 Aviation has confirmed to Channel 2 that pilot Craig Layson had two seasons of flying experience with the company in Talkeetna, and he earned his commercial aviation license in February of 2017 after more than four decades of private aviation experience. Pilots I spoke with today were quick to note that flying in Alaska is very different than it is in the lower 48. And according to the FAA, there are just short of 8,000 pilots registered in this state. That's nearly one per every 100 people in the air with a license of some sort. Pilots told me that flight experience here in Alaska is unique and invaluable when it comes to situational awareness and being a commercial pilot, flight, commercial flight scene pilot in extreme remote conditions. Very unique weather. Um, we probably have a lot more drastic weather than most places in the lower 48. And then, like I said, you know, so much of Alaska is only accessible by aircraft, so we have so much off airport operations where most places in the lower 48 are probably going from airport to airport, where we're going from, you know, maybe lake to rivers, you know, um, airport to a gravel bar or stuff like that. Again, all of the pilots and commercial operators I reached out to today were clear that they did not want to speculate about the cause of the crash or the pilot's experience and simply wanted to make the point that flying in this state is unique and full of challenges on a nearly daily basis. Mike and Alexis. All right, thanks a lot, Jack. We'll have more of this story later in the news hour and on KTUU.com.